My name is Hayley Edmonds and I'm delighted to be your host for this brand new edition of Change Now. We are live from the Grand Palais Ephemere in the heart of Paris for one of the most awaited environmental events of the year. Over the next three days, the summit will host conferences, a solutions expo, startup pitch sessions, workshops, and networking events. On top of that, for those who are present, there is an eco-responsible food court, sustainable art exhibition, film festival, Change Makers Village, and Change Now by Night Partner event lineup. So for those who are joining us from a distance on the Change Now website, Thank you for being with us and being connected from all around the globe. Right now, it is roughly 9.25 Central European time. So I hope you have a coffee or whatever refreshment for whatever time of day it is for you right now because we have a fantastic day up ahead of us today. So we're only a few minutes away from the official opening of Change Now in company of some very special guests who I'll present in just a minute, in just a few moments. Santiago Lefebvre, the man without whom this event wouldn't have he wouldn't even taken place, will open this fantastic event on the main stage just behind me, as you can see, the audience is gathering and, of course, many more are connected online. As you can see, just behind me, the main stage is easily identifiable. I don't know if you can see from there, but there's a huge globe swinging just above it. So, change now. It's the place to be with some extraordinary speakers. Get ready, because in a few minutes, I will hand over to a man who has pushed the boundaries of exploration for more than 30 years. Mike Horn, the world explorer, who is just right next to me. We're also delighted uh, to have the lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, Dr. Yamin Saheb, with us today. Firstly, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Ailey. I know, I hope you are doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's just uh, very warm these days in Paris. <laughs> That's true. It is oh, no, it's amazing to be uh, really inspirational. Yeah, great. And great things are lined up for us today. So what is Change Now? Well, it's an exceptional opportunity to hear and to discover passionate and informed speakers, change makers, people who want to help the world like us. who want to make this, pl this planet a much better one. It's more than 1,000 solutions, 400 uh, speakers representing more than 120 countries from around the world. It's three days of meetings and listening to outstanding and very prestigious speakers coming from all over the world. Politicians, companies, startups, expeditors, experts, you'll meet people with different perspectives. We have an audience eagerly waiting just behind us. So let's get started and greet our first invitees of the day. So firstly, uh, is this your first time participating in Change Now, Mike? Um, Hayley, yes, the COVID didn't allow us to participate, so this is the first physical part of, uh, participation. And it's always better to physically participate um, in an event because you can look at people, you can see people smile, you can feel the energy, and uh, I'm quite excited to be here. And we're excited to have you, you really have that interaction. Is this the first time you've taken part here, Doctor? It's the first time for in-person participation, yes. Well, it's great to have you here. So why do you think it's important uh, to have an event like Change Now, and especially at this time? I, I, I don't think it's important. It's, uh, it's absolutely necessary to get people together. And the climate is not, uh, it's, it's not a local problem anymore. It's a universal problem. And the more ideas, the more inspiration we can find from others around the world, uh, the more we will be inspired to play our role locally to be able to do this uh, the same. And when you sometimes think that you're alone, um, that's when you lose a lot of motivation and passion. But knowing there's others around the world doing exactly what you're doing is where really we can drive this move it, uh, movement forward. Absolutely. Yeah, if I would have to summarize the um, intergovernmental panel on climate change report, last report that you uh, referenced, uh, m mentioned earlier, uh, I would say that uh, the time for action is now uh, to make sure that the 1.5 degree target will not be out of reach. Uh, and that's why any uh, opportunity to make sure that people can work together towards uh, limiting uh, global warming uh, is welcome opportunity. 
change now. The change is now. Um, now, are you hoping to, en to achieve anything from this uh, event, Mike? Um, yeah, we, I don't think we can live without wanting to achieve anything. And, and as an explorer, um, sailed 27 times around the world, crossed both poles, climbed the highest mountains, swam down the Amazon. I've seen the world change and it concerns me. So why am I here? It's already because I'm interested in participating and playing my role uh, that could lead to change. And that is the achievement of wanting to be here. We've got similar like-minded people in uh, one of the most amazing halls and with the Eiffel Tower behind you. Mm. It's such a unique uh, location. And this is why I'm here. I'm here to listen to people, to learn and to understand. But also to give your perspective and your experience of what you've seen that, that probably 95% of us will never see. You know, you've been di you've seen directly the effect of climate change, I imagine, with your, your, explore, your explorations. Yeah, I saw, I saw the first grizzly bear kill a polar bear. Uh, usually, usually grizzlies never came above the, the polar circle. In 2006, when I did the first winter expedition to the North Pole, uh, I made a, a landing strip for Russian Antonov to do research on the North Pole, and the ice was two and a half meters thick. Mm. Two years ago, when I crossed in 2019, it was only eight centimeters thick. So two and a half meters of ice disappeared in less than 14 years. And yes, I'm the only guy in the world to have experienced it and have seen it. So to be able to come with first-hand mm. knowledge, to share with people, and it's not only to make people afraid, but to give people that inspiration mm -hmm. to really want to make a change. I think that's why I'm here as well. It's also to kind of make people aware outside of the, not necessarily just political, but also the public as well, making everyone aware and really kind of reaching out via uh, this fantastic platform that is Change Now. Hayley, that's 100% <laughs> the reason why we are here. You've, you've summed, it, summed it up perfectly. And the fact that we do have the possibility uh, to save our planet. Um, that excites me more than anything else. And when you look around and you see all the young people getting involved, they want to take the responsibility. And I think they're the biggest source of energy we've ever had and we've never used. Fantastic. And you can really feel the energy here. Um, now, talking about what uh, Mike was hoping to achieve from this event, what about you, Dr. Saheb? I mean, will you take this opportunity at this global event to discuss the report and alert not only the political and economic actors, but also the public too? Yeah, uh, this, uh, this event is an opportunity to uh, make uh, the IPCC report uh, easily accessible by everyone and not just the policy makers and uh, uh, industry leaders, but also citizens because each actor in the society has a role to play to make the change happening. And I do believe that uh, uh, putting together or gathering uh, change makers will lead to more uh, uh, change, uh, change makers opportunities and uh, building new, uh, new collaborations to make this change happening. Absolutely. I'm just going to highlight the fact that you came here on your bike today, didn't you? So Yes, of course. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> good for you. Um, now, without revealing anything that's go just about to go down on that fantastic main stage, what will be your underlying message that you want to convey uh, in just a few minutes? I think yeah, we've got one common goal, and that is what can we do, um, but actively. We've, I've seen, I've seen and attended quite a lot of these conferences, and sometimes I get a little bit frustrated because we we talk, and there's a moment that. My message is let's take this talk into action. Mm. And I think that's what we need. And we can't always r rely on, on the politicians. And when I was with the President Macron, I said each person can play his role. Mm. And we mustn't always rely on governments and organization and industry. Let's make it our, mm. our, our problem and let's turn our problem into an action that benefits our planet. And that's the message that we could get out to everyone today.
Absolutely, as you say, really starting locally and then kind of building up and reaching uh, the government. Um, how about uh, you, Doctor? I think each of us is a is an actor and should be an actor of the change and the metamorphosis that we need to put in place to make sure that we will be uh, we will not be uh, beyond 1.5 degree target because it's about our lives it's about our future our common future well, thank you very much for this kind of teaser trailer to, of what's to come up on the main stage in just a few minutes. I will let you go and get prepared for, for that. Um, and we are going to now introduce uh, our roving reporter, Laura Jane. So over the course of the next three days, she will be live reporting from all around the event, going to different stands, talking to people, really kind of getting feedback. And we're going to real kind of transmit the energy uh, that is here at Change Now. So so let's go to meet her over at Earth Village. Thank you. Hi everyone, I am thrilled to be here today at Change Now. We've been expecting this for a long time. It's finally happening. And I am currently at the heart of the Earth Village with Kevin Tayebali, who's the co-founder of Change Now. First of all, how are you feeling, Kevin? I'm feeling great. Thanks. It's uh, you know, we've been longing for it. It's been two years now. And uh, I couldn't be more excited about these first days. So many people that came from so many countries amazing speakers, innovators. We've seen already a lot of great meetings happening, so I'm, I can't wait to see you know, how fruitful are those conversations. Uh, so yeah, could it be more excited to be here today. As I said, we are at the heart of the Earth Village. What exactly is going to take place here? Yeah, so that's our actually a new baby at Change Now. It's the coolest place of the summit. It's the first time we're doing an outdoor space, and it's actually entirely dedicated to all the important stakeholders of the impact ecosystem, like communities, networks, such as uh, Ashoka, uh, One Person for the Planet, Changemakers Exchange, Make Sense, and, and many others, like the B Corps movement as well. And they're coming here, they are you know, they're gathering their community, they're throwing their own events, they're meeting with the audience, and it's gonna be their place. They, they have their own stands, they have their uh, community hub here to gather their, their, their people. And uh, so it's, it's a place that was dedicated entirely for them. We also have a great stage here with uh, a part of the programmation of the, of the summit with more than 300 seats. And we have a great circular show car by uh, Renault. And that would be one of the main uh, attractions as well of the day. And the main thing, the main reason why you want to come as well here is because you would be hungry. If you're hungry or thirsty, you want to come here because the food court is over there. You'll find amazing plant-based burgers and hot dogs made by Happy Vore. Also the Recho, um, uh, refugee food, uh, Les Empotés, Les Marmites Volantes, uh, and many others that are here. And, uh, you know, amazing sustainable chefs. And uh, also, if you want to have a drink and meet new people, come at the social bar at the end as well. And if you want a coffee, there's Terre de Café as well. So it's, you know, if you're hungry, if you're thirsty, it's the right place to be. And anyway, you know, it's the right place to be. So it's a cool kid spot. It's a cool kid spot, definitely. Amazing. Um, will, do you think it will happen again next year, that it's the first edition of the Earth Village? Uh, it might happen next year? Yeah, you know, it's, it was a test for us, but it definitely exceeded our expectations. So, yes, we're doing it again next year. The big question is, you know, how big will it be? And uh, it's probably going to be way bigger. Okay. Thank you very much, Kevin. Back to you, Hayley. Thank you, Laura. Jane, we will be catching up with you later on in the day. But right now, I am joined by Rose May Lucotte, a co-founder and COO at Change Now. Firstly, hello, how are you doing? Are you not feeling too stressed? Uh, actually, hello, and uh, actually I'm feeling super excited, uh, full of energy and really looking forward to the three days to come. Absolutely. Um, so you must be so relieved to be able to finally hold this event in the right conditions, you know, with people here in person. Uh, I mean, what does that mean to you? Yeah, you know, uh, last year we had to do it digital, digital and so we dreamed of this uh, summit for two years. Uh, we are actually right now doing what we wanted to do last year, plus we did a lot of ideas. Uh, so yeah, we're super happy to have this event uh, in physical. It, it absolutely changes everything, doesn't it? Because you can just feel, you know, there's that interaction and you feel that energy that, of course, you know, by no fault of anyone's, uh, we kind of lost with digital. But as I say, you managed to pull it off the, l last year with a digital edition. Now it's in physical and everyone, you know, the buzz around here is just fantastic. So. 2022 edition of Change Now. Uh, what is so special about it? And is there a topic that you're hoping to particularly highlight this year? 
Um, yeah, so this year we are going further uh, in terms of content and uh, in terms of experience. Uh, we are still focused on the four urgent issues, which are um, the resources, the climate, the biodiversity, and the inclusion. So all the sessions, all the exhibitor exhibitors will be focused on these four urgent issues. And uh, in terms of new steps, uh, yeah, we went really one step further. And so this year, to have more content, we added a fifth stage. Uh, we also had to go outdoor, because this was not enough in, 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 the, in one space. So we are doing our first, um, first area outdoor with the Earth Village. Yeah. And we also added a lot of art. Actually, we have a full art program with nine pieces of art integrated directly in the summit and the gallery of circular economy as well. So many new attractions this year. Absolutely, absolutely. So much going on here. So just tell me about the preparation. Uh, I mean, what we're seeing here must have taken so much preparation. Um, how many people were involved in making this happen? And you know, how many partners and speakers, etc. So yeah, to make this uh, edition hybrid, we had to grow the team. So now we are a team of 25 people. Uh, but behind the scene today, uh, for the for the summit, it's around 500 people. Wow! Yeah, it's a it's a big team of the staff, the team, the volunteers. Absolutely, yeah. because you say volunteers as well. Yeah. Yeah, we also have volunteers uh, who help us. Plus, also we have 400 speakers, 1,000 exhibitors. So yeah, it's a lot of people behind this summit. And a lot to kind of manage over the course of three days here. Yeah, as well. <laughs> it's going to be, it's a program is so full. Um, so how many people from overseas are you expecting? Well, that's hard to say uh, because as we are going digital this year as well, uh, this is also a way to, to be ecological. <laughs> so, but last right. year, uh, just to give you an idea, last year with the digital summit, uh, we had people from 167 countries. Fantastic. online so um, yeah oh, wow a lot of us uh, <laughs> yeah right so I mean we've obviously got loads of people here just behind me I mean it's absolutely packed at the main stage waiting um, for Dr. Seller and of course um, Mike Horn to speak uh, but I can only imagine how many people are connected and that I guess that's the beauty of now these kind of hybrid events is that we can really be a lot more inclusive and people can connect from wherever they are in the world without of course uh, making their, the carbon footprint so uh, just make our mouths water a bit can you give us a bit of a teaser uh, of what's up and coming and what's not to be missed? Yeah, well, for instance, today you will have uh, at 10 a.m. The, the world reveal of a new concept car. Uh, we will also have a delegation of athletes uh, with uh, the Olympic Games of Paris 2024. Fantastic. Uh, we will have a program called Forts for Change for impact investors to raise funds so that they will grow the ecosystem with more funds. Um, we will also have this afternoon the Startup Mobility Prize uh, with a duplex with a Bruxelles. Okay, yeah. And yeah, loads of uh, sessions with amazing speakers, amazing leaders of change, and 250 exhibitors to discover. As you say, there's going to be a revealing a brand new concept car from Renault and their CEO, Luca de Mille. Um, well, thank you very much for that. I mean, I'm going to be here and you made me even more excited to be here. <laughs> I can't wait for what's up and coming. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're just a few seconds away uh, from the opening ceremony. You're watching Change Now Live TV, which will fe feature continuous coverage of the event. So you will not miss out from wherever you are connected around the world. Or if you're lucky enough to be here, of course, well, you won't have to connect. Um, we'll be having exclusive interviews as well. And of course, I'm delighted to be with you here over the course of the event and for the opening of this event. So in a few seconds, you will see Santiago Lefebvre with the very insightful guests who we just met, Mike Horn, the great and unique adventurer and the lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, Dr. Yamina Saheb. So I'll now hand over to Lavelda, who's on the main stage. See you later and enjoy.
Good morning, good morning. We are super excited. Sorry for being late, but we are super excited. Are you excited? Yeah, yeah perfect. Well, we are super excited. All the team has wor have worked very late at night to, well, for this moment, this moment where we are meeting again in person after two years. And we wanted this moment to be intense and beautiful. And we had all that in our heads, in our imagina imagination for many months. And we hope you like it. <laughs> well, the last two years have been difficult. I think we went from crisis to crisis, COVID, war. Um, we also had the IPCC reports, uh, the crossing of planetary boundaries, so many things that just can make us I mean, lose faith in the fact that we can change things. And actually, at Change Now, we believe that, and we know, because science tells us that, that actually every degree counts, every fraction of degree counts. And also that every and each species counts, and every human counts. And so, at that moment, you understand also that any action you can take, that any solution, change makers you can hear here, solution you can see there, matters. And so I think it gives us the superpower to just know that we are game changers. We can really have this impact. And so now the question is the how. When you understand that, you know, is the how. And people ask us sometimes, um, where does change now fit in this huge change we have to, to make? Well, there are events like the COPs, uh, where it's the event more of the, of the what, of the how much, when, we said, OK, change now must definitely be the, the, the event of the how. How are we going to reach those targets? How can we really solve these issues? And to solve these issues, the how we were always wondering a bit more. And we say, OK, first thing, we, we, we need to understand what is the challenge we have in front of us. And the challenge we have, well, we, we know there is the climate issue. The climate crisis is, is the first one. But we have four equations to solve at the same time. So we have the climate equation, CO2, how much we meet, how much we can reduce our carbon emissions, how we can offset or capture the remaining, but reducing first. The second one is the one of resources. Every year, we're consuming around two planets every year. How can we just enter into the planetary boundaries? The third one is biodiversity. How can we save, safeguard the tapestry of life? As would say, Jen Goodall. Uh, that you'll see later. And the fourth one is the human, the place of humans in this transition. How can we make it inclusive? How can we include anyone in this transition? And also, how can we change our minds, our set of values to, towards a better future? So those, four, those are the four equations we have to solve at the same time. And the fact is that a unique equation just joining everything doesn't exist yet. Because sometimes what you can do on the climate, for example, uh, for batteries, is not, it puts a lot of pressure also on biodiversity through mining and through other uh, biodiversity and, and, and resources. So this unique equation doesn't exist. And I think this is maybe a challenge I put here. And I am pretty sure there is a field medal to the mathematicians who will find this equation, definitely. So the, if someone here in the, in the room or online, here's that, this is the challenge, find this equation. Now, also we need collaboration. And I will tell you a story. I'll, I'll take you back 2,000 years ago, or, or more precisely, 2,075 years ago. I take you to a city not far from here, Alesia. Alesia is a city of the Gauls. It's a city where you had 40,000 Gauls, Gauls warriors. And the city is sieged by 80,000 uh, 80, Romans, twice as many. What we don't really know about this story is that around the siege of Romans, there was a siege of other Gauls warriors. There were 240,000 around the, Gaul, the, the Romans. So you can really imagine how, if you manage to have this coordination between all the, um, the tribes of the Gauls, you would have reached the siege, but that didn't happen. They all acted by themselves, without coordination. And I think that change now needs to really play this 
role, you know, is part of this solution, the, the, sol the solution of collaboration. The place where whatever you are, um, an entrepreneur, you are an investor, you are a city mayor, uh, you are an NGO representative, you are an activist, you are a corp uh, someone from the corporate world, anyone, we need to work together. And I forget here also the citizens and the talents. We need talent to make this transition. And this sense of collaboration, my message is to say that we need to listen much more to the voices of union than the one of division. Because we, c we may hear sometimes division in, in what, we have to, what, we try to, what we try to achieve. So union first. So I think that we're going to start now those three days. The, for me, those are three unique days. That's amazing what's happening here. We have people coming from a lot of countries, most of the time by train, I mentioned. Uh, some people also joining online. And true story, two years ago, some, uh, a speaker came to me and, and talked to me at, at, on, on the Saturday. He was a speaker on, on Thursday. And he told me, look, Usually I come to the event, I, I, I do my talk, and I leave. I've been meeting amazing people for three days. Actually, that meant my day at that moment. And I really hope that you will be able also during this, those three days to meet a lot of amazing people. So I wish you a wonderful change now, full of action, of humanity, and hope. Go for it. change now fifth edition how awesome is this hands up if you've been here since the first edition there's a few of us I was there too there's a few of us congratulations you stayed here from the beginning we would be amiss to start change now without first looking at some of the details in terms of what what are the challenges I know we know them at a high level but sometimes it's really great to start by setting the scene. So I would like to, um, it, I would like to invite the lead author of the I, one of the lead authors of the IPCC, an intergovernmental panel on climate change, at the United Nations. It's a body for assessing science-related climate change issues. Please give an incredible change now. A warm round of applause to Yamina Sabad. Where is Yamada? Or I'm going to be doing this segment by myself. She's here somewhere. Does anybody know where she is? This is interesting. No? Is this some sort of joke? <laughs> Did I not do the intro right? Do I need to do it again? Is that what happened? Is Yamana here? Or are we going to just jump to the next one? I just need a like, heads up from somebody as to where we are. Because when I jumped on the stage, she was so totally here. So totally here. OK, we're filling. We are, we are officially filling. Um, <laughs> I may well jump to what I was going to say at the end of this session. So there's lots of different opportunities to connect here at Change Now. We actually have multiple stages that go on simultaneously. So as well as people joining here live in the room, we do have a lot of virtual viewers. Give them a warm round of applause to the virtual viewers. Hello. Beauty of the pandemic, we went global during the pandemic and decided we'd stay that way. So as well as being live in the room, it's great to connect with people here in person. We're also virtual. Are we ready? No? 
Okay, no problem. So, <laughs> thank you. So, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to jump forward um, and bring on to the stage somebody who's acknowledged actually as one of the world's great in, greatest modern day adventurers and explorers. He's under, undertaken exceptional feats of endurance, determination, and courage with over 30 years of pushing boundaries, exploration. Our next speaker's accomplishments are really unparalleled. Here to talk about determination and courage um, that it takes to travel uncharted waters. Please give, this is going to work this time because I've seen him earlier, please give an incredible warm change now round of applause for Mike Horn. Never, never had that kind of uh, warmth. There's always a first time for okay, everything. Okay, shall we sit down? Whew, I can take a breath now. <laughs> see, I saw him earlier. He's here <laughs> in the flesh. Um, so, Mike, I've been informed that um, what I'm interested in is, because some people might say, why have we brought an explorer here to talk about climate change? What would you say your explorations have done to inform your views of of the environment and the climate? Well, first of all, I think um, nobody better than an explorer to see what happens on Earth. Mm -hmm. And I've been a professional explorer for 30 years. So I sailed 27 times around the world. I crossed do. the highest mountains, swam down the Amazon, followed the equator around the world, and then crossed the North Pole and crossed the South Pole. And um, in 30 years of professional exploration, um, I've seen the world change. And it started to concern me. And the last expedition I did was when I crossed the North Pole from Alaska all the way to the other side of the world to Greenland and Svalbard. And it was an expedition that I spent 138 days uh, on the ice, moving on the ocean. And uh, in 2000 and, and, and 2006, when I reached the North Pole, the first ever winter expedition on the North Pole, the ice was two and a half meters thick on the North Pole because I made a landing strip for a Russian aeroplane mm -hmm. to do research on the North Pole. And in 2019, when I crossed on the North Pole, the ice was only eight centimeters thick. Get out. So two and a half meters of ice disappeared in less than 14 years. And that started to concern me, but added to the fact that I saw grizzly bears attacking polar bears. Um, and grizzly bears never came into the polar ocean. So um, yeah, there's a lot of changes, but I think there's a lot that we can do to be able to play our part in kind of reversing what's happening and to be able to stabilize what we don't want to happen for the earth to warm up 1.5 degrees. We don't want that to happen. So we've got to play our part, I think. So, I mean, it speaks already to any skeptics who are saying, oh, we've made it up. No, we've seen it firsthand. It's happening, folks. Um, what excites me is I hear that you've got a project that combines the environment with exploration and adventure. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? First, first of all, you know, we've got to speak about inspiration. Let's, we all here to inspire each other. We all here to lead change. We all here to feed off each other's energy. And that's what's quite amazing. And I've just got a little story to tell. When, when I was a little young boy, um, I, I was born in Africa. I was born in South Africa. My father was a Springbok rugby player, the best rugby team in the world. And the French, second best, but the South Africans, they always will stay the best, even if they lose. But anyhow, so my father being this amazing sports personality and a professor at university, gave me two important keys in life. 
It's to be educating yourself, to inform yourself. But today we've got so much information arriving and we don't know what to take on what's true or not. Mm. 38 years ago it was much easier because you had to read the newspaper or you had to listen to what your grandfather told you. So the, the, the news was really reliable. And then he gave me that key of working hard, of believing in yourself, and of inspiration. So when he played his last rugby match, I was a very young boy standing next to the rugby field, and they were playing against the All Blacks. And my father managed to score a try that made the team win, but it was his last rugby match. And I went into the changing room with him, and there this rugby player was sitting, and I was a little boy next to him, looking like up to him, and, and all the other players came to him and said, you know, you've been an example to us for as long as you played. Always first at the training, always last to leave, always listening to our problems, always there supporting us when we need it the most. Always there to give us, like we say in French, the conseil, to give us the right answers for problems that we didn't know the answers. And when I heard everything that everybody else spoke about, the qualities of my father, I believed that I wanted to be like him. And I think we all need to be like that. We all need to give answers. We all need to be able to inspire. We all need to be first to do something. We all need to stay the last to be able to clean up. And once you have a dynamic like that, that's when we can lead change. We've got to change not only what we do, we've got to change the way we think. We've got to be able to work together because the working together is the new competition. The world needs everyone to participate. And when, when these other guys left and my father was sitting there alone, I said, you know, I want to be like you. And he said, you'll never be me. So, what did he say after that? That was the most important. He said that you are you. You can't be somebody else. You all, we all have unique values that can make a difference. And I can see that you will be bigger than I'll ever be. And that is inspirational. We all have our own qualities. We all can play our own role. We can all make a difference. We don't have to all do the same thing. And every morning my father went running. From the age of eight years old, every morning I was behind him running and trying to keep up. He never ran any slower for me to keep up. It was for me to run faster. So what's the message about that? Guys, run faster. Don't wait to slow. Don't let people slow down for you to keep up. Let people run and run faster. Become stronger. And every day when I couldn't keep up with him, I drew a line on the <coughs> pavement. And every morning from eight years old, at six o'clock, I was awake. And the first thing I did in the morning, I beat that line. So my father asked me, why do you think I wake up every morning to go running? I said, you wake up because you want to add value to your team. You want to deserve your, your spot in the team. You want to be the change maker, the one that makes the difference. And he said, yes, that's true. But there's something more than that in life. We need something bigger. And what was that? He said, I wake up because you awake. I know that you want to beat that line. You inspire me. So guys, be the inspiration to change making. Stop speaking. Let's act. Let's make the difference. Let's run faster. We've got the capabilities. It's just somebody sometimes has to tell you, you can do more. It's not to do less, not to criticize, not to complain. We've got enough of that. Let's build a world with a different vision by changing, first of all, the way we think. 
I love that story because I think sometimes we can, especially in this space, we can look and think our little part isn't doing anything. And I love that you wake up in the morning, you're getting up because you think your dad's going for this run because it's, he's doing it in order to be a good footballer. Turns out he's doing it because he knows you're going to be up. Because, <laughs> because I was a little boy inspiring him. So we, whatever you do, whatever you do inspires people. It inspires people. Don't think what you do has zero impact. And that's where change happens. You've got to be able to inspire people, to help people go beyond you. And to be able to help people go higher than you and not push their ideas down actually makes you grow. It's interesting because I think sometimes we don't even notice the little things that we're doing, especially in this space that's having an impact on others. And you were fortunate that your father actually was able to tell you the reason he was doing the run was that you're getting up because you're inspired by him. Yep. It turns out he's getting up because he's inspired by you. And that's the virt uh, virtuous circle of inspiration. And then if you want to be an actor, be able to go through bad weather. Nothing worth doing in life will ever be easy. To cross the North Pole was done by one person in the world. It's not because it's easy that I choose to do it. It's because it's difficult. There's challenges. And if we become stronger, challenges and obstacles become smaller. It's not the size of the obstacle. It's the size of what we think is the size of the obstacle. Beautiful. I'm going to bring you back to the question I asked you earlier, because you're talking about challenges and adventure. How are you combining what you've seen in the world in terms of the need for climate change and adventure and exploration? So, so um, my, my life as an adventurer and as an explorer has allowed me um, to to have a certain amount of following. And I've got a, a lot of young people actually following more or less what an old man is doing. And, and every day we get five to ten emails of young people wanting to play a role to change the climate, mm -hmm. to be able to add value. And I can't, I can't be there for everyone. So I decided to create a platform, and this platform is called Pangaya X. So Pangaya is a platform, and every year I, I give a problem to solve to the young people. And any young kid in the world with an idea can to solve this problem. Yeah. And the first problem was, let's save the oceans. So anybody with an idea can give their ideas to the platform, then we look at their ideas, and then we accompany, accompany these young adults from an idea right through to the reality of their project. And it's not enough just to have ideas put together. We need to support these people. We need to accompany the young people. And that's what our platform allows us to do. And then I, I, I did a stupid thing once. I drove in a Dakar rally. A Dakar rally was with a car through the dunes and 12,000 kilometers and we pollute the planet and it's this carbon and all this crap coming out of the car. And I was criticized by 62 million people because I went on adventure, but it's the wrong adventure mm. to go on. So I said, I'm going to build a, a, a pila combustible, a fuel cell, to be able to participate in the rally that I have zero pollution, zero impact. And then this big research program started, and a week ago, I launched a company called InnoCell, building fuel cells. We're gonna change the world. We're gonna, we've got powertrains for buses, for trains, for planes. And now, we've gotta be able to take this technology and put it into mobility as we heavy, especially the heavy duty mobility, yeah. cargo ships, trains, buses, planes, and, and we're going to change the world. You have so many great ideas where you're able to take adventure, clean it up and still make it exciting. What do you say to people who perhaps they're in a space where 
similar to you, they love the adventure of it, but there's a polluting part of it. What's your, like, if you were to leave us with, here's the one message I can leave people with for change now, and in terms of making a, a personal impact. You've got lots of projects, but what would be your final the, word? It, 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 it's quite interesting to understand that when I wanted to cross Antarctica, it's 5,100 kilometers. Nobody wanted to give me permission to cross Antarctica. I had to do an environmental study. What impact do I have in Antarctica? I'm skiing every day. I've got no electricity. I'm eating food that's made for me. There's no waste. The food's packed in recycled packaging that I keep with me. My impact every day on the planet is zero. But I have to do an environmental study on crossing Antarctica. Then, somebody charging his iPhone once every day has a bigger carbon footprint than me crossing Antarctica. Because I sailed there, I'm skiing, I'm walking for a period of 138 days. I've got very little impact. So the fact is that we, as individuals, should look at our impact personally and not criticize others, because the moment you criticize others, you're not watching what you're doing yourself. Let's focus on ourselves and what we can do to be able to have a positive impact that can lead to change. And then, all together, we can tell people, hey, no, don't do this or don't do that. But stop looking abroad. Stop looking further than what you Ourselves. can do. Yeah, that's a really compelling message because everybody can do something there. I believe so. Well, thank you so much. I wish I could talk to you for longer, but we're... Let's go. Oh, oh, we're out of time. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Horn. Thank you. <laughs> So, I am told we now have a very short video, and then we are going to speak to the IPCC. Ta-da! So first and foremost, here's a short video. <laughs> Kia ora katoa. Hello from Aotearoa, New Zealand. I come from a Pacific nation. The stakes of climate inaction for us are high. Our coastlines would change forever. The food that sustains us would be lost. The industries that sustain our economies, agriculture, tourism, would be devastated. And with those industries go the jobs they support. That's the rationale for action on an economic basis. Let me turn to a societal basis with an example. A week or two ago I travelled to the east coast of the North Island of New Zealand, which had been battered by the fifth storm in the past year. People there were cleaning up their homes yet again. The road links that had been mended just months before had been destroyed again. A school needed rebuilding for a second time within a year. So we must look up and we must work faster. But highlighting the dystopia of not acting on climate change only goes so far. We must look to what we can all gain from acting now. Climate change is our greatest opportunity for new jobs and higher wages. For our country, already earning a premium from our clean, green and innovative image, there is an opportunity to use that natural advantage to create new jobs and new industries. That results in the double duty of reducing our reliance on global energy prices and the shocks that come with that, such as the rising price of fuel due to Russia's war on Ukraine. Consumers around the world are climate conscious and they are changing their spending to match. New Zealand aims to meet their expectations, and we will. Our Zero Carbon Act, for which we sought complete parliamentary consensus, drives us towards net zero carbon emissions by 2050. We banned new offshore oil and gas exploration, and we're the first country in the world to introduce mandatory climate-related disclosures for organisations. We all know acting on climate change is the right thing to do, but we need the how. This year, New Zealand will release our how, our first emissions reduction plan to put innovation and clean technology at the heart of our economic transition. 
We have already discounted clean cars, driving a tripling of new electric vehicles on the market, and we're building the charging infrastructure to match. We have several investment funds that help our sectors to do really practical things like get rid of coal boilers in our schools and help businesses to trial new low emissions technologies. Globally, we have quadrupled our investments to support countries most vulnerable to the effects of climate change, with half going to the Pacific. And we have a world first agreement with our farmers to reduce emissions in our agriculture sector in partnership. The world will always have its crises, the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, but the measure of a nation must be what we continue to do in spite of what is thrown at us. Climate change is a challenge we cannot and will not postpone, and it must remain on everyone's agenda. In New Zealand, we have learned from the 1980s that pushing against powerful global trends leads to painful corrections. We will act now and avoid unnecessary and costly changes from inaction. The climate crisis can make people feel helpless and fearful. And we're not immune to that anxiety, but rather than feel overwhelmed, I want us to feel motivated. I want my daughter to grow up in a world that hasn't been unbalanced by our reliance on fossil fuels. I want our Pacific neighbours and vulnerable communities elsewhere to be able to thrive in their ancestral homelands. I want to be able to enjoy the natural wonders of our planet without a sense of sadness at the unique species we've driven out, the thriving ecosystems we've destroyed. I'm aware of all we stand to lose, but I'm also hopeful. Taking climate action is a necessity but it is also an enormous opportunity. There's so much to gain by shifting to a low emissions economy, new jobs and opportunities, lower energy bills, more sustainable agriculture, less air pollution, healthier homes, exciting new technologies, flourishing native ecosystems, and overall resilience. My government is committed to delivering a better, more equitable and sustainable world and I know these aspirations are shared by people and governments across the globe. We all have a part to play. And we know that building future-proof, low-emissions economies will not only protect our environment, but also has the potential to build jobs, boost growth, and strengthen our resilience. As a global community, we can all contribute and we'll all benefit. As we seek to secure our recovery from the ravages of the pandemic, do we have the courage to truly build back better? and to leave a better future for the generations to come. I hope these days of discussion and collaboration offer many opportunities for you all to encounter new ideas, technologies and perspectives. And I hope we emerge newly inspired to make the change we know we need. Hey, awesome. You're gonna take that seat over there. We're back. Um, so I did promise earlier, we're speaking to a lead author from the IPCC. It's Yamina. Hello, welcome. Hello, thank you. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so we need to talk data and stats. We know that you've got new reports out, but tell us a little bit more about what it is that the IPCC does, how long these reports take to produce. Can you just give us a little bit of context real quick? Yes, sure. So the IPCC uh, stands for the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. Uh, it was put in place in 1988, but uh, by two international organizations, uh, United Nations Environment Programme and the World Meteorological Organization. The first report was uh, published in 1990. I mean, a while ago. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we, are, we just uh, finalized, uh, we are at the sixth round uh, cycle. Uh, and each cycle lasts around um, five to six years. Uh, our cycle did last a little bit longer because of the COVID, so we had to work remotely. And in, uh, we have three different reports, three different groups. One is about climate science, so it looks at uh, the physics of climate. Uh, that, this report was launched in August last year. The second one is about adaptation, and it was launched uh, in February this year. And the last report is the one I contributed to, is about climate climate mitigation, or in other words, about solutions. Uh, for, so for this one, for the third report, we were 278 authors. So it's uh, 278 times two hands writing. And we had uh, several contributing authors. Um, 
from different parts of the world. So the contributing, the, the, the authors are experts uh, from all countries. Uh, in our case, we had 65 uh, countries represented. 41% uh, are developing countries, uh, are authors from developing countries, and the rest are from developed countries. In our group, we don't, yeah, we are not very good in gender balance because our group is about uh, more economics and engineering, and you know, girls are not really encouraged to do these things. So that's why we are very, very rare uh, girls and that's why uh, we are 29% uh, of females and the rest are uh, males. So there is still progress uh, to, to be done in, from this perspective. And then uh, the report itself is, um, we synthesize, we read all our job is to read, and we do it on voluntary basis, so we are not paid for that, that's an important point. Uh, so our job is to read all the literature related to climate change, mitigation to the solutions, and to summarize this in a way that is understandable. So this is the main report. And then we have what we call the Summary for policymakers, this part of the report, this one, is the one that is approved line by line by policymakers. So we spent two weeks online with a representative from all countries and going through our, our, uh, our wording and they were saying, okay, this is clear, but this one is not clear. Sorry, I don't understand it. This does not make sense to policymakers. Can you please clarify it? And this is how it works. And then if there is disagreement, uh, so this means that um, some, uh, it may disappear from the summary for policymakers, but it stays in, in the main report. So the most important thing is that the main report is really science and that nothing changed in the main report. So it is accepted by government and not approved line by line by government. And the full report is around 3,000 pages. Okay, so 3,000 pages is a lot of words for a report. Can you maybe give us some of the key takeaways? Okay, uh, among, there are plenty, yeah? because uh, the last report was from 2014, and this one, uh, we are almost uh, more than seven years later. So a lot has changed. We understand much better uh, the solutions that do not work and the solutions that uh, would work or that are already working. And we, we have better understanding on how to uh, avoid to be above the 1.5 degree target. So there are a lot. Uh, maybe one important point is that in the past, we were used to uh, look at to, uh, policies, to solutions for climate change from supply side. So, for example, decarbonization of heat, electricity production, etc. What is new is that for the first time in this report, we have a full chapter on the demand. So, what would be the impact of reducing the demand? And looking to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the overall economy from the demand perspective. And this is a game changer in terms of thinking, and it's going to be a game changer. We, we expect that this is going to be a game changer from policy making perspective. So I give you an example. Uh, what does that mean? So if you have, for example, um, in the past, we had the policies to decarbonize. Uh, the focus was mainly about uh, uh, renewable energy, and uh, if it does not work, then negative emissions. If it works, etc. Um, now, if you look at it from the demand perspective, so your first question is, what do people, and when I, when I say people, it means all people in the world, and it's not just for white people in the global north, huh? uh, what do people need for their well-being? The needs, the essential needs of all of us are the same. It does not matter if you are in Dakar, in Paris, in New York, or uh, whatever city in the world, because we are human beings, we have the same basic needs. And then how to satisfy these needs? So what you need, you need a shelter, you need a comfortable home, a comfortable place where to live, where uh, uh, to be in love, where, uh, where to work, etc. We all have this need. And then the question is, how do we supply this within the planetary boundaries? And when we consider the planetary boundaries, in our case, so you look at to the remaining carbon budget to be uh, within the Paris Agreement, within the 1.5 degree target. So this means that you will have to rethink your policies and your solutions by each time you think about providing shelters, it's not just to have something beautiful, but it's about providing something that is within the planet, within the remaining carbon budget. And this is going to be a big change for the future, we expect, in terms of policy. Wow, so there's lots of policy changes, but there's the, you also mentioned the report suggests some solutions. Can you maybe give us examples of a few of the solutions that are suggested in the Yeah, so, so uh, maybe one point is that uh, the IPCC is uh, policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. Uh, 
So, and the policymakers during the approval sessions, they reminded us several times that it was not, we were not there to say to them, this is what you should be doing. So it's their job. Our job is just to bring to them what science, uh, the scientific evidence. And um, uh, among the solutions, for example, what we find out in the literature is the, the concept of uh, sufficiency. Uh, which, is, uh, which is known in some countries, but unknown in the majority of the countries. So we were asked to define uh, the concept because it was too technical and new for most of the policymakers. And sufficiency is about avoiding the demand for energy, materials, water, land, um, uh, while providing to each of us uh, well-being within the planetary boundaries. And when said in, the, in this way, so this means that it's about equity for all. Mm -hmm. Equity between all of us within the remaining carbon budget. And this means that, uh, for example, uh, for the global north, we need to revise uh, our uh, climate neutrality targets. So if I take the EU, for example, but I'm not saying this as IPCC, just as I, an EU citizen, I'm saying that. I'm not allowed as IPCC to say that. So... Um, as a, as a scientist, if you look at uh, the European Union uh, climate neutrality target, we are leading. We are, uh, uh, we are the best. If you compare to all other ones, we are the best. But in reality, this target does not take into account the European responsibility in the climate damage. So what does it mean? It means that we allow ourselves to continue to pollute. And this means that we are taking the right of other countries who did not contribute to the pollution, to the, to the climate change damage, uh, to, to develop. But if you look at it, if you apply the sufficiency concept to this target, then this means that instead of becoming, uh, instead of having a target to become uh, climate neutral by 2050, the EU should become climate uh, neutral by 2033. So you see, it's not the same. And if it's 2033, it's tomorrow. So basically, yesterday, the European Commission repub published a new, um, uh, to repower new recommendations, a new, um, new set of uh, proposals to uh, repower the EU, given the, Ukraine, uh, the war in the Ukraine. Uh, it's for this decade. But uh, actually, it should have adapted, used the Ukraine crisis uh, to adapt our current policies to make sure that we are in line with the, with the equity issue that is raised by the Paris Agreement, actually. And this equity issue is quite new. And that's why it's not yet in the policy making. But usually what we see is that what is in the IPCC report, even if it's not prescriptive, we see it in, policy, in policies in 10 years, 10, 15 years, except that this time we don't have enough time left. So the time for action is now our countries, and I will say this as an EU citizen, the EU should actually read carefully the IPCC report. And when reading, reading between the lines, if science is saying that we should not go in this direction, that this direction is wrong, it means from policymaker. Uh, from a policy-making perspective, we should not go in this direction. And for those who want to download the report, presumably you can just download it straight from the IPCC yeah, yeah, website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can download it. It's, uh, it's free of, of charge, of course. Uh, unfortunately, for the time being, it exists only in English. When I said it's uh, 3,000 pages, it's the full report. The summary for policymakers is just 63 pages. I hope it's readable. Uh, but I had an experience with my student at Sciences Po, the Political Institute, uh, the, uh, the Institute for Political Science in Paris, and uh, so I asked my student to read the summary for policymakers. So you have uh, one from each group. Eh? So when I say 3,000 pages, it's just our report, the one on solutions. So you also have 3,000 pages from the first two groups. Eh? So in total, you need to read almost 10,000 pages. Um, and then, uh, but I asked my student to read the summary for policymakers from the three groups, which is already 60 pages for each, approximately. And uh, they have read them. And they helped them to understand uh, the summary for policymakers. And then they did come up with a conclusion, because I told them, what is your recommendation? They said, this is not a summary. 63 <laughs> pages is not summary, I'm sorry. And they, they prepared for us recommendations. And they said, oh, we need two, three pages, and they explained to me, you know, we are the young generation, we don't read 63 pages. We, we will never read that. So Six, 63 as a summary is a little bit much, but it is completely available for people to yeah, go and yeah, download. Yeah, it's completely available. So I'm consciously aware of the time. I just want like a word, like if you could leave people with a single word in order for them to make the most out of this conference today, over the next three days, what would it be? I would say that uh, the time for action is now. This decade is extremely important for our future in this planet. And to make sure that the right things will happen, we need to put pressure, especially in our democracies, democracies on our policymakers to do the right things, because currently they are not doing the right things.
Thank you so much for your time. Sorry we couldn't spend longer. It's Yamina! Thanks to you. <laughs> Thank you so much.